All right. Praise God. Well, let's welcome, man, I'm excited. Let's welcome our global community, our locations, and our DSM partners are now joining us through our DSM different platforms. So we have people by the thousands that are a part of these services and that are seeking God's will as it relates to Victory Life and to Dwayne Sheriff Ministries. So would you welcome all of those people? God bless you guys. Thank you. Man, the word of, of grace and truth is having an impact around the world. So it's exciting. Well, I want to continue sharing on the subject of restoring broken hearts, how God restores broken hearts. And I want to, I want to segue into God's heart to forgive us of sins, but also to restore us even when we've done a piece of stupid. Am I the only one here today that's done a piece of stupid a time or two? No? Yes? <laughs> Thank God for the listening audience. I know there's pieces of stupid out there, amen? <laughs> we all just do things at times that, man, we hurt ourselves and can break our own hearts through personal bad choices and sin. Then there's the sins of others that are imposed upon us many times in life. I've shared with you about my mother's broken heart and how she would have done literally anything to stay married and not be divorced. And yet she experienced the brokenness of divorce and an unwanted divorce. And uh, again, that sin against her, not no fault of hers, literally broke her. So you've got your personal sins that can bring brokenness of the heart. You've got the sins of others that can bring brokenness of heart. Many of you experience some type of of child abuse and it was no fault of yours and it broke you on the inside and God wants to heal you of that. And then there's sin in the world, just sin in general. How many of you know there's evil in the world? I don't care how many people try to discard the reality of evil. There's evil in the world and evil people doing evil things that break human hearts, that break families, that break careers. There's a lot of pain that we experience in this life that can be a result of our personal sins. And so we need to be quick to, to, to repent and receive God's forgiveness and then trust him beyond just forgiveness to restoration. A lot of brokenness by the sins of others. We have to be quick to forgive and to release people that have broke us, damaged us, or we carry that damage many times generational. So, we have to be quick to forgive even as we've been forgiven. And then there's just evil in the world. Again, that bad things happen to good people. There are bad things that happen that we just don't have an answer for, but it's just sin in the world. We live in a fallen world. And until the return of Jesus, there are things that happen to all of us that we can't explain. It wasn't your personal sin. It wasn't even the sin directly of, a, of an uncle or a parent or, or an employer or an employee or a church member or a pastor. Or We just don't have an answer. We don't know why that happened to you, but it broke you. Here's the bottom line. Jesus heals the brokenhearted. Jesus cares regardless if it's your personal sin that has broke, broke your heart, the sins of others that have broke your heart, or sin in the world that's broke our heart. Psalms 34 verse 18 and 19 say, the Lord is near those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Faith does not make us immune from trouble, but rather by a merciful God gives us double for all our trouble. If not in this life, I assure you the life to come, the life to come. And so we have to deal with this brokenness of our culture, brokenness of, of, of our homes, brokenness of the human heart and condition. In Psalms 147, verse 3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Luke chapter 4 is our main text. Let's look at this again and kind of launch from here. Jesus has gone into the temple 
and he takes the book of Isaiah and he reads from the book of Isaiah. And so I'm going to look in this session at what Isaiah said that Jesus was quoting, but let's look at what Jesus said and then we'll go back and look at what Isaiah had said and what he was reading out of. He goes to the book of Isaiah, look at verse 18 of Luke 4, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The King James Bible says to preach liberty to those that are bruised. Jesus will not break, we've seen, a broken reed, and he will not cast off a smoking flax. And we spent a whole hour on those two, those two symbols, those two analogies of the, of the human condition and the human heart. Well, again, he went to the book of Isaiah, and he's quoting from Isaiah. And one of the things about the Bible that you have to understand in your personal studying is when you see a New Testament scripture and it's a quote from the Old Covenant, you've, you need to go back and look at the quote because there'll be things there that weren't brought over into the quote into the New Testament because our Bible would be so big, we would need a wheelbarrow <laughs> to get our Bible in here. The Bible says about the Bible and about Jesus that if everything the man said would have been recorded, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain it. He said a lot of things that aren't recorded. And so he would even do a quote and just give you part of the quote. And I know the frustration the Lord must have felt in some of that. Because I would like to read the whole chapter of Isaiah 61. It, it is one of the few chapters that <laughs> the whole chapter is over the top positive. I mean, a lot of chapters you'll see good things God is saying, but then bam. And then a few good things God says, and then bam. In Isaiah 61, where Jesus was quoting here, that whole chapter is nothing but blessings, but I can't even read all of it. And I'm going to read some things that Jesus didn't say that Isaiah said in its full context. People always talk about the importance of the context of a, of a passage, and I'm, I'm no different. You need the context. But man, it's difficult in these short settings to get the context of anything you're sharing because you got the context of the, chap or the, or the chapter of a book, and that's hard to, to get a hold of and you can't read it all. Then you got the context of the entire book of Isaiah. We can't go through all of that. Most of you won't sit there that long. <laughs> Paul used to preach so long that people in the balcony fell asleep and fell out of the balcony and broke their neck. I don't want any of you hurt today. The good news is he raised him from the dead after he broke his neck, but I might be having a bad hair day, so we're not going to do the whole book. <laughs> then you've got the context of the whole Bible. So we, we have to be careful even when we, when we say context, we do our best. I do my best. I never want to take something out of context and twist it. But I can't read the whole Bible in one setting or a whole book. Or even in this case, the whole chapter. But let's look at Isaiah 61 and glean some things that are part of Jesus restoring broken hearts, healing broken hearts. How that God not only forgives us but truly desires to restore everything the devil steals in our brokenness. Man, I look back at my brokenness before I met Sue and my personal sins had broken me and just sin in the world had just literally broken me. I was a very broken person. And yet God didn't just forgive me and he didn't just start me over even on a level playing field in the kingdom, he restored. I can take you back if I had time and show you how God has restored everything the canker worm had stolen, everything the devil had stolen. It's like I got a sevenfold return once the thief was found out. And Isaiah is one of those chapters, Isaiah 61, let's turn there, where you see 
God working all things together for good to them that now love him. Where you see God bringing good out of bad. God is so good at bringing good out of bad, religious people get mixed up and think he does bad to bring good because the good is so good, they think there had to be the bad to get that good that is so good. And I'm telling you, God doesn't have to do anything bad. Just get up and breathe. And bad stuff happens. But God has a way of working all things together for our good. He's taken all of the things that devastated my life, devastated my family. Generations of devastation and restores one person, changes one person's life and now reverses generationally all those curses, all the damage of generational sin. See, some of the brokenness that many of us experience, maybe not in this room, there's some. I guarantee you, people that are watching right now all over the world, some of the brokenness is generational. That you can trace it back three and four generations. That this family got broke and broke the generation under them. And because of the brokenness of that generation, they broke another gen generation. They're called generational curses in the Bible. And they're real. And a lot of the brokenness is nearly inherited. And this is why we, we want righteousness to prevail in our communities. We want morals and values to be established even in our communities. We're trying to spare generations of unnecessary brokenness has nothing to do with self-righteousness or anybody's better than somebody else or I'm right and you're wrong about something. It's about hurt. It's about the pain that sin brings. And we aren't made saints. Man, this is discouraging. We're not made to bear the pain that the human heart carries today. We're just not designed for all this rejection. The heart is not designed for all this corruption. It's not designed for sin. You can only take so much in your heart of rejection and abuse and just simple pain. And so thank God Jesus is nigh the brokenhearted. A lot of times when you get broken, if it's generational or it's personal sin or it's something somebody get, did to you, you feel like God's a thousand miles away. And that's why the scriptures are so important and faith is so important. I felt like God was truly, I, I felt like God had forsaken me when I met Sue. And now looking back, it's incredible how nigh he was and he was a breath away, one breath away, one confession away, one I repent away. He was so nigh. A lot of times in our churches, we feel like God isn't very nigh, but he is. In Isaiah 61, look at the quote now. You can see the quote at the beginning that Jesus did in Mark, uh, Luke 4. Look at verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. See, that's verbatim, word for word. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. So Jesus translated it, good tidings is the gospel. The gospel is good tidings. It's good news. And the first audience that God sends us to is the poor. And the reason for that is the poor just seem to be more open to the good tidings than the rich. God loves the rich. But the rich many times put their trust in riches and they reject the Lord. And so God is sensitive to the poor because they just seem to be more receptive to him. They draw nigh to him. He draws nigh to them. And God is making sure that we never forget that the message is to the poor. And it's good tidings to the poor. You don't have to be poor no more. And that's another thing that I feel like the Lord spoke to me at the beginning I've got to deal with again in the right spirit 
is this issue of prosperity and why do people struggle with God willing to prosper you? You may be broke today. You may be the poor of the poor, but that doesn't mean God wills for you to be that way. And how anybody can be honest and say, God doesn't will to prosper us. I, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Because you can look at the old covenant and God prospered them. God prospered Abraham. God prospered Isaac. He prospered Jacob. He prospered Israel when he brought them out of Egypt. And 430 years of slavery, they left with gold and silver. All through the old covenant, God prospered them. Then the same people who don't believe God wills to prosper us today jump over into heaven and talk about mansions, streets of gold. Why don't they preach? God's just got a shack for you in heaven. Because we sure don't want to mess your heart up with a mansion. You got prosperity in the old. You got prosperity in the, the new heaven and the new earth. But God doesn't will for us to prosper in the middle. It doesn't make a bit of sense or biblical sense at all. Yet people oh, oppose prosperity as much as any mes message in the Bible. And yet Jesus came to bring good news to the poor. And good news isn't God wills to make you poor and God is the one keeping you poor. That's not good news. So we're supposed to preach good tidings, good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God. So you have this quote now, Jesus is quoting out of Isaiah 61, but as you continue to read, you see the benefits of a healed heart. You see the benefits of the Lord healing broken lives. You see the benefits and God's plan for us to not just forgive us or bring us to some place again of level ground. But you'll see as I read this, there's at least six things God has taught me out of this. There's, there's, there's more, but six things that I've experienced that I can tell you is in the Bible. I've lived it, experienced it, and I've seen it now generationally in my own life. I've seen it in our church, all six of these. So after he says those things, he goes on to say in verse 2, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 says, Zion is the church. To give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified, and they shall rebuild the old ruins, and they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolation of many generations, the desolation of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the foreigners shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers, but you shall be named the priest of the Lord. And they shall call you the servants of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double everlasting joy. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. Double. You'll receive. How many of you would like to have double for all your trouble? I don't know about you, but I've gotten double for all my trouble. And that doesn't mean I haven't had opposition or afflictions. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of half of them. <laughs> well, some of you are paying attention. The Lord delivers us out of how many? All. Well, all, I looked that up in the, in the Hebrew, it means all. Yeah, lots of bad stuff happens to all of us, but the Lord delivers us from them all. And so, 
you've got at least six things, and within the six, you could break it down into, into more. But for the sake of time, the first one is, in verse 2, 1 and 2, he says, comfort and console those who mourn in Zion. God wants us to comfort you, not condemn you. Now, a lot of people get confused when you preach righteousness, when you preach God's moral standard, they accuse you of condemning people. Like if I teach sexual purity, people say I'm condemning people. No, the Bible says they're condemned already. If they won't come to the light, they love their darkness and embrace their darkness. Jesus said they're condemned already. He didn't come to condemn the world, he said, but to save it. But then he talked about those who embrace darkness, those who love darkness. He doesn't condemn them because they're condemned already. So I'm not condemning anybody when I teach God's moral standards. I'm not condemning anybody when I teach values and God's word in regards to morality and our homes, our communities. No, people who reject the word of God in their unbelief and rebellion, the Bible says they're condemned already. And so you need to know if you've turned your heart to the Lord, regardless if personal sin has broke, broke you, the sins of others have broke you, the sins in the world have broke you, God isn't here to condemn any of us. He's here to comfort us. Turn back to Isaiah 40 quickly. Isaiah 40. I've got a whole series that came out of this years ago. But Isaiah 40 verse 1. Comfort ye. Comfort. Yes, comfort my people. Comfort my people. He's not talking about the world and the condition of the world in sin and darkness. He's talking about God's people that have come to the light, come to repentance, and yet mess up, fail, fall. Some get kicked down. Others, when they're down, get kicked. And he's saying, comfort them. Speak comfortably or comfort, or comfort to Jerusalem. Cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for, he, for she has received from the Lord's hand double. Everybody say double. double. Double for all her sins. This is a prophecy of Jesus and the coming of Jesus, and we're going to get double for our trouble. We need to understand our warfare with God is over. That Jesus accomplished our warfare with God by burying our sins on the cross and our guilt and condemnation on the cross, and that God is not mad at you. God is not at war with you. You don't need to be at war with God. No matter what kind of brokenness has come into your life, God didn't do it. God isn't at war with you. He's made peace with us through the blood of his cross. Now we need to be at peace with God. Tell her, that her iniquity is pardoned, but then she'll receive at the Lord's hand double for all her sins, double for all her iniquities. See, God didn't want and doesn't want to just forgive us. He wants to restore us. He wants to bring us back to his original plan for our lives and fulfill all his good will in your life. That God doesn't will anything but good for your health, good for your finances, good for your marriages, good for your children. Double for all our sins. Now go back to Isaiah chapter 61 and look at, look at verse 3 to console those who mourn in Zion. Just because you're saved and just because you come into the church, Zion... God's holy mountain, the mountain of grace, doesn't mean brokenness doesn't knock on our doors. This is something I have not fully understood about the average Christian. For some reason, they still think if I serve Jesus, if I'm committed to the Lord, if I have faith, everything's gonna, gonna be smooth sailing. And it's just not true. Again, faith doesn't make us immune from trouble but God's grace and your faith will give you double for your trouble. 
because God is nigh those of a broken heart. Now look at this. Number two, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. When you look at that, you see that God doesn't just forgive and we start at ground zero. He says, I will give you beauty for those ashes. I will take the ashes of your mistakes. I'll take the ashes created by the mistake of others. I'll take the ashes that come from just evil in the world. And I will bring beauty out of the ashes. Man, that's huge, saints. That's a promise that every one of us need to cling to because every now and then we wake up and there's a pile of ashes. And we have to fight that, that temptation of how did this happen? Why did this happen? How could this happen to me? What did I do to deserve this? Some of, you, some of you had a child and it turned two and you went, what sin did I commit in a former life <laughs> that this would come upon me? <laughs> Others, that thought comes when they turn about 16. <laughs> no, I'm trying to cast a lot of thoughts down right now. I need to hurry. But it's like, how did this happen? It's, I mean, this is the one, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but boy, just be careful with this and this one. Is this what I get for serving God? I'm coming to church. I'm paying my tithes. I'm reading my Bible. And this is what I get? Amen. You don't want to go there. I had somebody one time, and man, the Spirit of the Lord gave me a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. They were, they were, they were talking about what I'm sharing now about what good is it serving the Lord? What good is it coming to church? What good is it reading my Bible? Look at what's happened in my life. What good is prayer? That's the one that finally got me. I kept my mouth shut as long as I could because people are hurting, you know, and you just, you just need to endure. What good is praying? And man, the Lord gave me a word of wisdom and thank God they were able to receive it. That's why we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit, not so much at church and church services, but in real life. And so that word of, word of knowledge, word of wisdom came to me and I said, you have no idea what could have happened had we not prayed. See, we tend to look horizontal that, well, I prayed and prayed and look at this, not knowing what would have happened had we not prayed. We have no idea the effects of our prayer by circumstantial evidence many times. And so we pray because we know God hears us. And if we know God hears us, we're confident we have the petitions we desire, no matter what our eyes are telling us in the present situations. So he, he's going to give us this, this beauty for these ashes, oil of joy for mourning, garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Have you ever felt like it's like a garment of heaviness is on you? I've met some of you. You're, you could start a clothing industry. <laughs> that was good. Oh, you're carrying a coat upon a coat upon a coat upon a coat of heaviness. And God wants to exchange that for praise, real praise. Man, that's good. That they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. For me, brokenness had made me very unstable, unpredictable, unreliable. Anybody listening? The brokenness in my life because of personal sin and sin in the world had made me unstable, unpredictable, unreliable. And one of the things the Lord did when I, when I cried out, when I repented, when I turned my whole heart toward the Lord, it was almost immediately he made me a tree of righteousness. Stability came into my life predictability came into my life. 
It's a joy living the life I live now compared to the path I was on. And how many people, I know it said behind me, but behind me back, I know it said behind my back more than to my face, but it's a blessing when people look at me and go, well, I already know what you're going to say. I already know what you're going to do. Well, you talk about the opposite of that before I met Sue and had that open vision of the cross. See, God wants to make you stable. He wants to make you a plumb line in, a, in your home, on your jobs, in, in, in our community. And I'm, I'm, so much of everything I say just comes at the moment. And I have to stop for a minute and go, wait a minute, I can't tell that. But man, I just heard a horror story. I can't even tell close. People will sell their soul for a dollar. They'll sell their families out for a tank of gas. God wants you to be a person of integrity. I'm not talking about perfect. I'm not talking about you never make a mistake and never fail, fall, or, or, or let somebody down. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about God wants you to be a tree, a tree of right. Trees have roots. Trees can endure the winds and storms of life. God wants you to be this witness of restoration that people can look at you and go, man, you were a mess. I remember, but man, you're, 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 you've got integrity. He says, I will do that. I will plant you to bring glory to my name. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up former desolations. They shall, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolation of many generations. God cares about generations. He's the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I know it's hard on us. Listen to me, dear ones. And I know when your flesh is weak and you're tempted with sin or you're tempted to compromise, that it's difficult sometimes to get past the short-term consequences of even doing the right thing or ignoring the short-term and not even knowing the long-term consequences of doing the wrong thing. What if we really understood that our actions today not only will affect our tomorrows, but could affect a generation? And I know I'm, I'm, I'm not preaching to the choir right now. I know that I'm appealing to the mature among us. That I catch myself in this instant gratification mode. I want it now, and now means a minute ago. Right? not being able to look down the road. I don't believe my family, I don't believe my dad that, that ran moonshine for a living, not my dad, my grandfather. I, I don't believe, I believe he thought it was the only way. I, I remember the story decades told to me later that my grandmother I knew was the only Christian in the family. That's how I came to know the Lord originally was through my grandmother. And, and, and she didn't like him running moonshine. And she was getting on to him. My grandmother was full-blooded Indian. Uh, and there were just some cultural issues between white and Indian and then cultural issues between male and female that have changed. That it's just a part of the culture. This is what young people don't understand. They just act like history starts with them. And the whole world thinks like they think right now. And a hundred years from now, people will look back at the Lord Terry's and think we were the most corrupt generation in the history of the planet. Not so politically correct and moral. So there were, there, were, there were these cultural issues. And so grandma asserted herself 
And, and my grandfather, the story goes that if you can tell me how to feed 10 kids another way, I'll quit now. Things were different. I'm not justifying moonshining. Did everybody hear that? Everybody listening to me in Broken Bow. <laughs> I mean, I was at church in Broken Bow, one of our locations, and I was having problem with my throat. And I made my grandmother joke about she'd make a little mixture for me. I didn't know what it was back then. And boy, I'd drink that. It would cut the phlegm and I felt good. And a guy from the church came up and offered me some pure moonshine. He's probably watching right now. I'm not, it's not against the law what he's doing. He didn't sell it. I didn't buy it. But I asked Zach to hold my moonshine. I'm tackling the devil. Sometimes you need moonshine to tackle the devil. So I'm not justifying a still in the mountains. I'm simply saying it was different, a different world, a different time, a different culture. And in his mind, he thought there was no other way to feed 10 kids. My grandmother picked cotton in the cotton fields and it just didn't generate enough income. And so... My point being, I'm still on track. I guarantee you, if I could have talked to my grandfather, it probably never crossed his mind the unintended consequences and alcoholism that was generational in the family. Just wiped, wiped them all out. We just don't think many times long-term about anything. Even in church culture, it, I don't want to condemn anybody, but it's troubled me in the past, even my generation that's among us, how that we have to think generationally. We have to make sacrifices now for generations to come if we're going to see the blessing of the Lord on your great, great grandkids. Yeah. And the generation before me, the World War II generation, they thought that way. This is why, this is why you saw a different mindset of that generation when it came to savings and good stewardship. It's why they thought everybody has to go to college to prosper, which is a misnomer. But they knew you got to have an education or generational poverty will follow you. And so God is saying, I want to do something generational in your lives. I want to forgive you and heal you of all your brokenness. But I want you to understand I'm not, interesting. I'm not interested in a ground zero proposition. I want to save your kids. I want to save your grandkids. I want you to make better life choices and think generationally. Well, I could say some things politically here that would purge the church. No, 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 no. We all need to thank God I'm running out of time. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. The sons, the sons of the foreigners shall be plowmen and your vine dressers, but you shall be named the priest of the Lord, and they shall call you the servants of our God. God wants to make you a priest in your home. He wants more priest to be raised up among us, and we be priest of the city. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, look at this, instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. And instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Their, 
Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. There it is again. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. God wants to give you double for all your trouble. God has given me double for all my trouble. There are things that I wish I could just open up and share about my life and just the destruction of my life before 1980. But I'll, I'll be honest about it. I'm, I'm embarrassed to even look back and think back. How could I be that way? How could I digress and de become a degenerate at, at, at that pace? Loving God. It's scary to me. And while I can say, okay, I'm embarrassed and I have shame, I can also say, though, I have double for all my shame. It's just I need to wait till I get to triple. Because I don't even think back. I can't think back. Go to Matthew chapter 1, and let me just tie all this together with the genealogy of Jesus and how God brings good out of bad, how God brings beauty out of ashes. How God can take our messed up lives, saints, and absolutely change a world for good. I've guarded my naive heart. As difficult as things are on me, as much as things bother me, I've, I've worked at guarding my heart and remain naive about certain things, I really do believe we're in a third great awakening. I really do believe we're going to be okay. I really believe a generation is going to do the right thing. Because I've just seen God in my own life bring Isaiah 61 to pass, and I've watched him do it in other people's lives. This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus. This is, the, this is the family tree that got Jesus in the earth. And before I even begin to read all these names, I'll just be right up front with you. They weren't perfect. You think if God's going to build a family tree, he's going to pick the cream of the crop. He's going to pick the best among us for sure. Pharisees kind of thought that way, that God can't even use the worst among us, much less pick the worst among us. Look at these names. This is the book of the genealogy. This is the family tree of Jesus. These are the people God used to get Jesus in the earth to save us all. Abraham begot Isaac. How many of you know Abraham had some problems? We don't have time to get into all that. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob's the first car salesman in the Bible. You don't want to buy a car from Jacob. You don't want to buy a chariot and kicking the wheels isn't going to be enough. And yet this guy's in the family tree of Jesus. Through his repentance, everybody say repentance. God brought beauty out of those ashes. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah and Tamar. Perez begot Hezron. Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Abinadab. Abinadab begot Nishon. And Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Ruth begot Jesse. Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her, by her who had been the wife of Uriah. That's bad stuff. That is grace on steroids. <laughs> Amen. And time would fail me to make sure I balance everything out 
and make sure you understand, I'm not saying you can be just a reprobate and God will still use you. Solomon, Solomon was one of the best kings of Israel, yet at the end of his life, he fell off the cliff. That guy had 700 wives, 300 concubines. At the end of his life, he's writing, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. <laughs> he lost his mind. God would never will more than one wife on any man. That didn't come out right. I meant <laughs> Solomon was the wisest man on the planet because of all the counsel he had. Did I fix it? <laughs> his wives turned his heart and God said they would toward terrible gods. And yet he's in the, the Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute, a high-end prostitute. I got to be real careful here. <laughs> she lived on the wall. You didn't live on the wall without prestige and money. She's mentioned in the New Testament in honor of her faith when she hid the spies, that she did it by faith, faith that has actions. And she wound up, her and her entire family saved, but listen to this, her faith engrafted her into the family of faith. She married Salmon, a Hebrew, and now through her came a member of the genealogy of Jesus. God taking a life of prostitution, total ashes. There's nothing can break you like prostitution. Again, it's hard to talk about publicly and, and say things, but I'm just telling you, that's a broken life. And yet her faith in God didn't just bring forgiveness. It brought, it brought such restitution. She had a functional family, happily married, and brought forth the genealogy of Jesus. Is that not awesome? All of us need to shout. I mean, if God can do that for her, what can he do for us? Notice the terminology and, and David brought forth Solomon by her who was the wife of Uriah. David did some horrible things, saints, and you can't, you can't, you just can't paint the picture any other way than God painted it. It was terrible what he did to Uriah. It was terrible, the adultery. It was terrible, the pain and the consequences that he did create generationally. Sin has consequences. Don't misunderstand me. But we serve a God of forgiveness, a God of restoration to where once David and Bathsheba lost that baby that was conceived in adultery that broke Bathsheba's heart, God brought forth Solomon who for a season was one of the most awesome kings they had. And even at the end of his life, I know got right with God. God puts these things in the Bible to encourage us that no matter what's happened to you, no matter what personal sin has brought brokenness, no matter what sin others have committed against you that's brought brokenness, no matter how much brokenness has come from sin in the world, God is nigh the brokenhearted and he's here to forgive us, give us the grace to forgive and not just heal us, but restore us to a great plan. Amen? Amen. Amen. Somebody give him praise. Thank you, Jesus.
Lord, I thank you for stretching forth your hand and touching people deep in their hearts, healing brokenness of the past and generational ruin. I know you're working mightily. We can't see it with these eyes, but you still are the healer of a broken heart. And Lord, many of us are sitting here as a testimony of restoration. May we comfort those that are hurting. May we comfort those around us with the comfort that we have received. In Jesus' name and for his glory, amen and amen. Well, give the Lord praise one more time if you got anything. Thank you, Jesus. We have partners down here to pray for you. They enjoy praying and comforting, not condemning or judging. And if you need anything, please come to the altars. We'd love to pray for you. Otherwise, you're dismissed. Let's pray for the, let's pray for the construction. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for a breakthrough on the street out front. Thank you for the favor we have. Thank you for the blessing we've been. But Lord, we need this done. And we just pray just for movement, just for godly movement there. Thank you for the construction of Project Ben Big beginning and it going well. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.